Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We'll be starting very shortly, but welcome to you all from wherever you're joining us. Well, good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning to everyone joining from wherever you are. Um, I'm Ian Welsh, and I will be your moderator for the next hour or so. So welcome back to the Accountability Framework Initiatives Company Training Webinar Series. We kicked off last year with an introduction to AFI and continued with in-depth webinars on the use of the framework for supply chain management, scorecards reporting, and other topics. Now, don't worry if you miss any of these, as recordings of the relevant webinars are still available on the AFI website. Now, today we're going to be discussing how to use the new deforestation risk toolset from AFI. We have some presentations that will guide you through two key publicly available tools, Trace from Global Canopy and Global Forest Watch Pro from the World Resources Institute. Companies can use these tools to assess, map and monitor their supply chains in line with the accountability framework's principles and guidance. We have an expert panel assembled to provide insight into how these tools can be used independently, together and alongside other data sets and processes and to provide a more holistic understanding of supply chain risks, impact and performance. So I'm delighted that joining me will be Leah Sandberg, who's a global policy scientist at the Rainforest Alliance, Helen Belfield, policy director and trace lead at Global Canopy, Anne Rosenberger, who's a global engagement manager at the World Resources Institute, and Pedro Amaral, senior sustainability manager at Mars Pet Care. Now I'll turn to our panel very shortly but we do want to engage with everybody on the call. So please use the Q&A function for any questions you have or points that you would like to make, and I'll put them to our panel. Please try and keep the questions short and to the point. No Castro-style monologues, please. Um, and if you do keep them short and to the point, it's much more likely that we will use them. Okay, well, welcome to everybody. Um, let's now get into our presentations. Um, Leah, welcome. Uh, perhaps you can start off by thinking a bit around uh, what the accountability framework says about how companies should carry out risk assessment, supplier management and monitoring, and how the coalition is working together to ensure that tools are available and aligned. Leah. Thanks, Ian. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today for this discussion of how the accountability framework supports and is supported by tools that help companies measure, monitor and manage the deforestation and ecosystem conversion risk in their commodity supply chains. I'm gonna start off today talking about the guidance that the accountability framework provides to companies and to other stakeholders, um, and then describe how companies can use specialized tools and platforms to implement that guidance, um, including the two, two tools that make up this deforestation risk tool set, Trace and GFW Pro. So central to the accountability framework itself is the fact that it's a collaborative effort of more than two dozen organizations in the AFI coalition, working together to accelerate progress towards commodity supply chains free of deforestation, ecosystem conversion and human rights violations. And it's really that, that, really, that consensus and collaboration among those initiatives um, that um, brings a lot of value to the, um, sort of to the guidance that's provided here. So at the heart of the framework lies in its 12 core principles, which lays out the coalition's high level expectations, company action. This begins with the elements that make up robust goals and policies to protect ecosystems and human rights and moves into key implementation processes such as internal management systems, uh, supply chain management, responsible production, engagement beyond the supply chain and monitoring and verification. And finally, best practice for reporting on progress towards achieving those supply chain goals. Each principle is supported by detailed operational guidance and how-to resources. Companies at different positions along the supply chain and at different points in their sustainability journeys may use the resources and guidance most relevant to their needs. Sorry, it was a chat back and forth. <laughs> um, so the focus of today's conversation is on managing supply chains to address deforestation and conversion risk. And the framework can support companies at each stage of that process. Companies looking for resources on setting no deforestation and no conversion policies can access framework's guidance on application of definitions related to deforestation and conversion and our how-to guide on writing strong policies. Those developing supply chain management and monitoring systems can review detailed guidance on what those 
ecosystems can and should include and to help ensure progress towards reducing deforestation and conversion risk is effectively reported on, the framework provides guidance on scope and content of robust disclosure, including a guide to using existing reporting systems effectively. So in addition to providing resources for the companies themselves, the accountability framework and these principles and these guidance act as a basis for alignment and consistency uh, among a growing number of tools and platforms that companies can use to implement the framework's principles and guidance and to report on their progress. Uh, these aligned tools and platforms include standards, standards and methodologies that support responsible land use planning and land management, tools for monitoring and traceability, sector and industry platforms, reporting and assessment methodologies, and responsible finance initiatives. Across these diverse tools and platforms, alignment with the framework provides consistency and comparability of definitions, of scope of corporate action, of metrics and indicators of both risk and performance, and of best practices for company actions, including best practices for risk assessment, traceability, supplier engagement, and monitoring. Our focus today is on two tools, Chase, Trace and GFW Pro, that companies can use to monitor and manage supply chains in alignment with the framework. So what does alignment mean in this case? It means that these tools are aligned with the framework on definitions of forest and natural ecosystems. They're aligned on scope, for example, in that all commodity volumes in a company's supply chain should be included in assessments of deforestation and conversion risk and performance. And they help companies follow the framework best practice for supply chain management including assessment and monitoring of both direct and indirect suppliers, and the need to monitor and measure the impact at the level of the farm or plantation when possible, at the level of the sourcing area or region when it's not. And they provide information that's relevant and compatible with the reporting and disclosure platforms that are themselves aligned with the framework, um, such as um, coalition members like CDP Forests and other platforms like uh, GRI. So in summary, through the deforestation risk tool set, companies can use the accountability framework to set supply chain goals and understand best practice for implementing them. They can use key tools to assess, map, manage, and monitor their suppliers, and then use that information from those processes together with the framework's guidance to report effectively via disclosure systems, uh, such as CDP Forest, GRI's new agriculture sector standard, as well as to quantify portions of their land sector emissions uh, for inputting into various um, emissions reporting methodologies and towards emissions targets. Um, so I am going to turn it over to our other speakers to talk about these tools and their uses in much greater detail. I'm happy to take more questions as we go on. So thanks so much. Leah, thanks very much, Leah. Thanks very much for introduction. Quick question for me. Are there any particular types of companies that you think this is most applicable for right now? I mean, who, who do you think are the kind of companies that you really see as the ones that should be engaging in with this tool set immediately? Absolutely. Um, so I think that... Uh, various elements of this are really applicable for companies up and down the supply chain. Um, you know, for companies who are managing um, a portfolio of suppliers with sort of known um, footprints, um, tools like GFW Pro are incredibly valuable, whether that is um, upstream companies sourcing directly from suppliers or downstream companies with sort of a, a wider view to their supply chain, um, sort of companies who have less visibility are able to use tools like Trace to get an estimate of their footprint. Um, I think that um, upstream companies would also find a lot of value in, in tools like uh, GFW Pro um, for sort of understanding the footprint of their, of their operations. And then sort of most importantly, the accountability framework itself is really um, fully designed to provide guidance for companies from producers through retailers um, and all aspects of this process. So, um, these particular tools will have, have uses for um, you know, most of the, the companies that we would interact with that are managing either a portfolio of suppliers or sort of a host of different um, operations and, and uh, processing or producing sites. And then similarly, just to add that other stakeholders such as financial institutions trying to understand um, the holdings of, of their clients uh, would also find this really useful. Great, thanks very much, Jeet. So. Uh, if you are listening in and you are in any particular sector or you're wondering how the uh, tool set uh, is relevant for you or the, how you can use it best, do put a question in the Q&A and we'll come to that a little bit later on. But uh, Leah, thanks very much indeed for, this, for setting the scene so, so well. Um, okay, let me turn to, to Helen. 
Helen, um, let's turn it to you and perhaps you can start off by giving us a bit of an insight into uh, what is Trace. There we are, we're getting an introduction to Trace and how it works and how can companies use Trace to meet stakeholder expectations for risk assessment and supply chain mapping in line with the accountability framework? Helen. Great, thank you very much for having me and thanks for that introduction, Leah. So next slide. So Trace is a supply chain transparency initiative of both SEI and Global Canopy and it uses publicly available data to map commodity supply chains, connecting markets and trading companies to their subnational sourcing regions, and therefore to environmental impacts like deforestation in these regions. So the next slide. So for example, for Brazilian soy exports, if you click next, we can see, we can map the flow of soy from municipalities on the map on the left, which you can see here, via soy silos, crushing facilities, and ports through the exporters, then the importing companies, and to countries of import. And we can then filter this. So if I could search Germany here, I can see a subset of flows, and I can expand this to see that Germany's direct soy imports the majority of these are coming from three municipalities, which I can select. So from Morte de Rio Preto, Sao de Zadirio. And we can see on the map that these municipalities are in the Mato Piba region, which is an active soy deforestation frontier. And you can also resize these flows by deforestation risk associated with the soy coming from each of these municipalities. So next. Next slide. Great. So how can Trace, um, once it's mapped these supply chains, how can it help companies um, conduct a risk assessment? So firstly, it can identify risk hotspots and help prioritize entry points. So the map here is showing uh, soy deforestation risk associated with the EU's soy imports from Brazil. And we can see that the risk is highly concentrated in the Mato Piba region, which is highlighted on the map. And even though the Mato Piba provides only 9% of the EU's soy imports from Brazil, it's associated with 80% of the EU's deforestation risk. And this pattern is repeated across commodities. So we see across all of the commodities that trace maps that more than half or half of the, at least half of the deforestation risk associated with exports comes from less than 5% of the production localities. Next slide. So practically, um, an example of how Trace is working with consumer goods companies to undertake their risk assessments. So uh, one example, we had a, a partnership with the Soy Buyers Coalition, which is now within the Forest Positive Coalition of the CGF and ProForest, um, to work with a small group of companies to identify their common sourcing areas and priorities in terms of their exposure to soy deforestation. So this led to the selection of 10 municipalities in Brazil, where they were going to prioritize their collective engagement in these places. And we've now replicated that with the UK Roundtable on Sustainable Soy, and also with a number of luxury fashion brands who are interested in their soy exposure through, through leather. And to do this, where companies have no supply chain data, um, we are able to do a high level risk assessment based on the import markets. So if there's a retailer who's active in France and Germany, we can use these import markets as proxies for that retailer's risk exposure. Where companies, however, know a little bit more about their supply chain, so they may know an exporter, a port or an asset, we can connect the trace data to the company data to give a much more tailored uh, sourcing area for that company uh, and a much more tailored risk assessment. And this is where GFW Pro, which Anne will talk about next, uh, can also complement Trace. So once uh, a company with little visibility has identified um, their sourcing areas and where there's identified high risk priorities, um, that's where Global Forest Watch can provide more granular and real time deforestation risk alerts in these priority municipalities and around identified high risk assets. Next slide. And finally, just, yeah, just to end, so Trace at the moment covers more than 60% of the 
global trade and forest risk commodities, um, covering South American soy and beef exports, Indonesian palm and pulp exports, um, and we're just expanding to cover um, cocoa exports from Cote d'Ivoire as well. Um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, looking forward to any questions as well. Thanks, thanks, Helen. Uh, thanks very much indeed. A couple of questions. Uh, one of which is coming in from our um, from our audience. And thanks very much indeed. Um, question, and it's a very good one. It points out that um, some of the data on that you were showing there, you know, a couple of years out of date, twenty eighteen, I think, some of the words. Um, is there, you know, wh why is that? Are you able to update the data? Are, are there particular challenges? I would imagine that there might well be just. To, difficult to getting hold of data from look authorities and, and everything else. I and mean, there's lots of uh, potential barriers there. So what, what, what is the uh, opportunity for updating that data and you know, what are the challenges you're dealing with? Yep, so two quick responses there. It is a challenge. So the backbone of any trace supply chain map is per shipment data, which we then aggregate. And that can come from customs data, from bills of lading and for cargo manifests. For Brazil, we've had to change our source of data um, so it's taking us a little bit longer to work through that, but we're actively updating our Brazilian soy and beef models now and hope to publish something um, next year. Um, but it does remain a challenge. It's also why we don't cover things like Malaysian palm oil because that per shipment data is not available. And as many of you will know, the EU does not make its per shipment import data available, which is going to be a key, a key issue in terms of implementing any legislative proposal on that. I think the other thing just to highlight is that supply chains in many cases are quite sticky. So a lot of these trading companies have invested significant um, finance in assets and in relationships with farmers. So even though the data is um, older, it still acts as an important risk assessment that can still be used and is still relevant given the stickiness of these relationships. And that's where more real-time data from something like Global Forest Watch can also complement where there may be recent changes or, or recent risk alerts as well. Thanks. Um, another quick question. Um, your current slide here is talking about covering, uh, you cover just over 60% of trade and forest risk commodities. Um, the barriers are getting to 100%. I guess are those relating to the data disclosures you just mentioned? Are, are there other barriers getting to 100%? Yes. So I think it's around the availability of data, and particularly the per shipment data, um, but also um, some commodities are more challenging than others. So particularly um, for commodities with large um, supply bases like cocoa and coffee. A lot more of the sourcing is via indirect supply, which provides more challenges for mapping, for mapping those commodities. Um, and again, it depends on data availability. So Trace um, works on publicly available data. So this is changing all the time. We're seeing an Indonesian palm oil, um, where again, our model at currently is for 2015. We're just about to update that in the next couple of months. And that's may be made possible by the fact that traceability reports are now covering 98% of Indonesian palm exports, which just wasn't the case in 2015. So disclosure is really changing the landscape of what's available and hopefully um, that will continue to go in the right direction. Um, but we're seeing in Brazil things, you know, data is less available than it was a few years ago um, as well. Great, thank you very much indeed. Let me turn now to, to Anne. Anne, can you just give us a bit of an insight into an introduction in fact to what uh, GFW Pro is, how it works, and how companies can use that tool uh, to manage and monitor their suppliers in line with the accountability framework. Um. Thanks a lot, Ian. Um, next slide, please. It's, uh, it's really great to be here with uh, you all at whatever time of day you're, you're joining us. So thanks uh, so much for the invitation. The, the organizers. Um, so many of you might already be familiar with the broader initiative that I work with, which is called Global Forest Watch, which is really all about harnessing the power of satellite imagery and big data processing and spatial analysis to create actionable insights on what's happening in the forest around the globe. Um, next slide. Uh, GFW makes more than 200 data, spatial data sets from a whole variety of different sources available through four different web-based tools. Uh, the data that we, that we host consists of our core forest change data that shows when and where forests are changing at various frequencies um, and also resulting emissions and then dozens of contextual data sets that then help to further shed light on the possible drivers and impacts on climate, biodiversity, and people. 
Uh, and our four tools are tailored to specific use cases. So we have our flagship site, which really aims to reach a broad range of actors uh, with uh, different data visualization and analysis functionality. Uh, we have our, uh, our GFW Forest Watcher, which is like our GFW Mobile, um, which allows users to access and uh, report on deforestation alerts, even when they're out in the field and, and offline. And then we have our, our, our kind of our DIY GFW, um, your build your own GFW, which is our map builder to help you, a user create customized uh, applications and, uh, and interfaces. And the tool that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about today is Global Forest Watch Pro for business. Next slide. So GFW Pro has been designed with uh, input and direct collaboration with many companies, financial institutions, and other stakeholders who are directly involved in the monitoring and management of agricultural supply chains. And we've designed the system to really help meet their specific needs. Uh, the aim of the platform is uh, to help users identify and monitor um, and manage deforestation related risks, alerts, progress, and impacts. So a user starts uh, by engaging with the platform by creating and logging into their own secure account on the platform, which uh, we've designed with uh, best-in-class data security protocols in place. Next slide. So what does DF GFW Pro actually do? So once the user logs in, uh, they would start by either selecting or, down, or, or uploading location information that they would like to analyze and creating that into lists. So this can be uh, jurisdictions next or uh, a, a GPS point uh, with a related supply shed around it. So that could be like a processing facility or a production facility or detailed farm boundaries if they have those available. They can analyze those uh, a, a few at a time, a list at a time, or create a portfolio with hundreds or even thousands of areas to analyze. Next. Next. Uh, Pro then supports three kind of basic buckets of analysis for different uses. Uh, that I, that's the way I think of our analysis, at least. We help to identify riskier assets, so creating risk assessments to help prioritize areas for follow-up. We also then look at deforestation and fire alerts to help monitor and respond in near real time. Next. And then we also uh, mark and assess progress towards reaching sustainability commitments and looking at impacts of operations over time. And so the way I really see the intersection between the tools uh, and the deforestation tool set building on, on what I've just talked about here is that I look at it as like the accountability framework, really defining rules of the game and providing the playbook or the instruction manual, trace providing the supply chain traceability, uh, as well as a snapshot of risk and helping uh, connect uh, uh, information on linking actors to risky areas. And particularly for companies who don't yet have a lot of visibility in their supply chain that links back to some sort of uh, uh, production or processing location information, which is needed for interacting with GFW Pro, traces the place to start. So then for a company, once they do have some sort of level of uh, location information about their suppliers production or processing origins, um, and that could be information that they've done their own digging on and collected themselves, requested from their suppliers, uh, or that they've even gathered from Trace, uh, GFW Pro can then help to dive in deeper on analyzing a portfolio of those locations uh, and monitoring those locations over time. So diving in, taking a closer look at the risks and changes to risk over time, tracking alerts, and then assessing progress and demonstrating impact by looking at trends over time. Now, uh, next, uh, just looping at this back to um, the AFI, uh, the analytical outputs from GFW Pro can then help to monitor and measure commitments and metrics that are defined by AFI. So when we're really looking at what's next for GFW Pro, one of our main areas of focus um, will be on really uh, further developing uh, better support for reporting functionality for outcome and impact metrics in line with key initiatives specifically like AFI. So this will be looking at how we can more closely align our analytical outputs with AFI metrics, but also helping to facilitate businesses to more easily aggregate supplier data in the platform and share information up and down the supply chain. Um, next. You can click through a couple just to show these. Uh, a, a few just uh, reflections uh, on 
uh, the different buckets of analysis that I mentioned within GFW Pro. Um, we've noted that these have kind of varying levels uh, uh, or different values add for different points in the supply chain. So the near real-time alerts, for example, tend to be most useful for those who are closer to the production areas and with most direct contacts with actors on the ground, whereas risk assessments have tended to be most useful for those kind of mid-supply mid chain that have some level of visibility but are still looking at how they can prioritize areas or suppliers to follow up with, whereas this reporting and sharing functionality um, and standardization of, 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 of metrics and platform usage uh, that, that's going to be one of our focus areas moving forward, we see is really uh, kind of exponentially more useful as we move further down the supply chain. Although I'd also note that further upstream can really also use those sort of uh, reporting metrics as well to help uh, comply with their, their buyer requests. Um, just lastly, on the next slide, is just a quick uh, snapshot of who's using the system so far. So we already have more than 300 institutions uh, monitoring areas across 95 different countries. And we've actually got a pretty even split between supply chain actors, financial institutions, and then other organizations like government, NGO, certification bodies who are using the system. The areas that are monitored cover actually more than 1 billion hectares of supply areas in total. Um, so that's how, how many uh, hectares folks have loaded into the system to be keeping track of. And uh, we'd love to uh, engage with you to, to give you more information on how you can create an account um, to, to dive in on how the tool might be, might be useful. So please be in touch. Thanks very much, Anne. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Thanks very much for those. Um, in the interest of time, let's get straight on to our final panelists, though, and we'll go back uh, to, to Anne and to Helen on some of the questions. Um, okay, so uh, let me turn now to Pedro. Uh, thanks very much indeed for your uh, patience, Pedro. So, reflecting on what you've seen from the presentations, how does Mars use geospatial data, risk assessment, and traceability tools to? to achieve and report against supply chain goals, including deforestation and, and climate targets. Pedro. Thanks for the question, Dion. Thanks for having me and thanks for everyone who's joining us today. Uh, before getting into that, let me just call out that Mars has uh, very clear public facing commitments around commodity sourcing and deforestation. Uh, they are all anchored in a land use change and deforestation position, which is available on our website. Um, and I'm in charge of leading the implementation of our beef and soy uh, sourcing commitments. So I'm, I'm going to be speaking from, from that perspective, from the soy and beef uh, perspectives. Um, the commitments that we made um, are aligned with AFI. So alluding to what Leah said, uh, AFI was one of the sources of inspiration for uh, setting the goals and, and, and having clarity as to what we need to call out in this commitment. So we are very clear as to addressing not only forests, but also other types of native vegetation. We're very clear as to uh, the countries that we are addressing, the laws that need to be respected, and beyond that, uh, the cutoff dates uh, for different biomes and the different commodities that we're sourcing, as we're also very clear as to the implementation process and, and the deadline for full uh, implementation. Uh, the other thing that I want to call out is that there is a direct relationship between our uh, deforestation commitments and our climate commitment. We have recently announced uh, a net zero um, target by 2050 with some uh, intermediary deadlines. And, and as you can also see on, on Mars website, uh, approximately 40% of all our greenhouse gas emissions are estimated to be coming from land use change. All this to say that uh, implementing our deforestation uh, free commitments is, is key for us uh, in achieving um, also our uh, climate ambitions. Now, the process that we are adopting to, to implement the commitments um, consists in mapping, managing, and monitoring our supply chains. And, and as I'm, I'm going to be explaining very briefly, mapping relies a lot on, on traceability and, and geospatial uh, risk analysis. Uh, mapping means mapping the origins of what we buy to a level that allows us to have insights on, on how those commodities are being produced and in the beef and soy cases, it means mapping to the first aggregator level. So mapping uh, the, the, the ingredients that we buy all the way to the slaughterhouse level and all the way to the silo or to the crusher, whoever uh, first got the ingredients from the farmers. 
uh, and then have a geospatial risk analysis uh, uh, run across our supply base, taking into account the supply shed of, of each uh, specific um, first aggregator. So, so this is about mapping. Um, and this is about mapping the origins and mapping the, the risks, uh, which is actually mapping the exposure of, of those um, first aggregators to non-compliances with our uh, commitments. With that in mind and with that clarity, what we do is uh, start managing the supply chain. And the first thing that we can do is engage with our suppliers and asking what they're doing. Uh, because despite the fact that they can be exposed to policy breaches, they might already be adopting measures uh, and having you know, a process to implement the commitments themselves that will address those risks. So engaging with suppliers in at-risk regions to begin with and asking what they are doing about that. Now, um, if they don't have the right measures in place to mitigate that, that risk, what we do then is, is offer support. Is we offer support to, to connect them with the best practices uh, in the country um, and, and deploy the technology or deploy or help them increase their capacity to then adopt those, those measures that will ultimately allow them to, to meet um, our sourcing commitments. And, and what we expect from them is that they not only uh, supply us with uh, uh, beef or soy or other ingredients that meet our sourcing commitments, but that they adopt the same sourcing criteria across uh, everything that they trade. Um, this is one of the key uh, building blocks of the theory of change behind Mars um, sourcing commitments. Um, so again, engage with suppliers, check what they're doing already. And in multiple cases, we, we can have really good surprises because uh, in fact, most of the solutions are actually being developed by the suppliers. Uh, if they haven't been adopting that, we then offer support. So they adopt that. And another thing that we can do is redesign the supply chain. We can buy from elsewhere. We can buy from someone else whose uh, um, sustainability ambitions align better with uh, Mars sustainability ambitions. So, so, so this is about uh, managing. And, and then the next step is, is monitoring um, uh, our supply chains to, to check for any changes that might influence this entire uh, process. Thanks very much. Sorry, um, sorry Pedro, just, just a quick follow up on that. I've been interesting talking about um, there are so much of the solutions coming from suppliers, but you still have the opportunity to redesign supply chains in certain circumstances. To what extent do you use the tools to engage with your suppliers when you're considering um, you know, a change? You know, is it, it gives you the demonstrable proof that what you've required of them isn't happening. Is that the, a useful part of the tool? Absolutely, yes. We share with them the data that we got. We, 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 we give them the chance to to show uh, something different because the, the thing is they will have uh, a level of analysis that we don't have. They will be able to analyze every single farm and every single, single supplier that they buy from. And we are analyzing their supply sheds. So in the end of the day, the responsibility for uh, monitoring every single purchase, um, um, is, is, it, it's a different responsibility. It's a, it's a shared responsibility, but, but the level of analysis and the level of control and granularity is going to be different. Uh, so so one, one clear example, um, or two clear examples, one on beef and the other one on soy. Um, so, so beef suppliers in Brazil, uh, sourcing from the Amazon, they have uh, today a, a very clear sourcing protocol, which builds on the developments of the past 10 years of the work that uh, a number of meat packers have been developing and, and, and now uh, was harmonized with support from an NGO that is part of the AFI uh, called Ima Flora. So, so if you check the Beef on Track program, there is a very clear protocol as to how suppliers, how, how meat packers uh, in the Amazon can, can scrutinize every single cattle purchase they make against satellite imagery and against a number of other criteria. I mean, this is one a clear example for, for, for beef. Uh, the other example, which is um, a quite successful one, and very well known is, is the Amazon Soy Moratorium. Um, so if a supplier is sourcing from, from the Amazon, um, we, we request a supplier to be a signatory of the moratorium. And we not only request them to be a signatory, but we also uh, request from them um, the letter signed by Greenpeace and Abiyov is stating that their audit reports were checked and, and, and they, they look good. Okay, um, 
Pedro, just um, final, uh, further question, really, and it's this one. I mean, companies approach these tools in, in different ways, but from your uh, experience then, what, what do you think or how would you advise companies, especially those who are just beginning to understand their deforestation risks, um, what do you advise in terms of the tools and approaching the tools um, and using them in the right and best complementary ways to understand their supply chain? So are there any, you know, Pedro's top tips? Map your supply chain. You need you need you need to have the traceability later to a level that allows you to have the right conversation with the suppliers. And 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 the geospatial analysis uh, will will help you have those right conversations. So map the risks and and then engage uh, with with your suppliers. Um, and I, I see a lot of benefit from 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 tools such as GFW Pro and Trace. Um, and, and trace with the level of granularity that they can provide companies with in terms of tracing commodities to their origin um, and, and potentially even supporting with the embedded soy uh, topic, which is still uh, quite a challenge for, I think, most of the downstream companies trying to address that. And, and, and GFW Pro as a very powerful tool uh, with, uh, uh, you know, juice spatial analysis available for every, every single region and, and, and both tools freely available uh, and, and, and potentially uh, supporting a lot these uh, mapping exercise and further engagement that downstream companies can, can have with their suppliers. Great, thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you uh, everybody for your questions. I've been uh, watching the, uh, the Q&A box and I've seen a lot of our panelists already answering your questions. So thanks very much to the panelists for, for engaging with the audience. And that. Um, one question I do want to put, um, and I want to put this to, to Anne and to Helen. Um, question around um, combined, the combined, or how the combined offer from Chase and, and GFW Pro can help companies with their due diligence process in the context of the uh, EU regulation on deforestation and, and as it changes. So, um, do you want to comment on that first, Helen? Yes, sure. So I guess the, the we're expecting the proposal any week now to get the first draft. So that will, um, I think that will provide some of the answers around the expectations of due diligence. But I think as we've discussed today, Trace, um, I think will be a very useful tool in terms of prioritising um, hotspots and where further due diligence is required. So it's really at that high level risk assessment. DFW Pro um, will be and Anne can comment on this, but really around the level of where we're getting down to specific assets, specific plantations, specific farms. Um, so I think that's where they complement each other. So trace and helping prioritize that high level risk assessment of where further due diligence is required for the traceability efforts, really getting down to that farm um, or concession level. And that's where GFW Pro can then come in in terms of providing that, that real time um, deforestation information. And do to take that forward? Is that, is that where you see your, you see GFW Pro, that's the kind of the best jumping in point? Yeah, no, I, th I think that, that that's exactly right. I think that uh, then GFW Pro can also then pick up on um, uh, the time kind of time step element of things once you do have that location information. So um, not just looking at one specific point in time, but then looking at what's happening moving forward. So whether that's the near real time alerts um, and looking at how to address what's going on as it's happening um, or uh, looking over time as companies are looking to, to assess progress towards their commitments and then report on progress towards their commitments or impact of their operations over time on a longer time step. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm going to try and get through as many questions as possible. So panellists, if um, I will probably go to individual members of the panel to answer questions. If you do want to come in and make a point, just use the raise hand function and I'll, I will turn to you. Uh, Pedro, we're, we have a question for you. Um, and the question is about how you, um, you marry your supply chain or, or you engage with your supply chains when there is a lack of data. Um, and the example is given uh, data between indirect farms in Brazil. Um, and how do you include the impact of cattle laundering? I didn't know that cattle laundering was a thing, but um, it sounds intriguing. Uh, but you know, Pedro, how do you deal with um, such instances? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge challenge. And I'll start with the second question, um, la cattle laundering. So the new protocol that I alluded to, it has uh, included some mechanisms that, that try to some extent to address that. Um, so this is one of the ways, uh, and, and, and asking from our suppliers, the use of that harmonized protocol 
um, is, is one of the practical ways to, to, to start addressing that. Now, as to the indirect cattle uh, supply chain, um, there are multiple solutions being tested. I think Trace can play a big role in helping with, the, with that uh, because they have managed to, to, to gather uh, the, 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 the transit animal guide documents from, from multiple states in Brazil and, and they can cross-reference that with specific um, slaughterhouses. So, so it will allow companies to, to have more visibility of the, of the supply chain. There are other tools, uh, including VZPAC um, um, and, and other approaches being adopted um, uh, by, by large meat packers in Brazil that we're also paying close attention to. But, but from, from, from our perspective, we, we, we are hoping to support the deployment of these new uh, technologies that will allow further visibility of the supply chain. But not only that, we also want to support programs that we will help, that will help ranchers uh, that have been blocked by the current satellite-based purchase control systems be reintegrated. Because it's not only about coming up with a new request, but also being able to help deliver the solution that ultimately will benefit um, the entire supply chain. Thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed, Pedro. Uh, Leah, I wonder if I can turn back to you. Um, and just really thinking about we've had lots of questions from people from different, um, different sectors, uh, different organisations. Um, and there's some of you alluded to in your comments originally, but how do you think the combination of the, of, of the, of the deforestation risk tool set could be best used by, for example, traders in supply chains? What are the things that you think are most applicable to them? Um, and perhaps also think about um, uh, financial institutions as well. But let's think about traders. So um, how, how traders can best use the tool set, that's the... So yeah, yeah I mean, traders are, are certainly a, a key audience for, for I think all of the, the work of all of the, the folks on this, um, on this call. They're a, you know, a sort of key component of, of every supply chain that we're talking about. Um, as far as the you know, accountability frameworks guidance is concerned, a lot of our guidance is, is directly applicable for companies that are such as traders that are purchasing from you know, a wide variety of, of producers sort of across um, multiple geographies, across multiple commodities. That's one of the, I think the values of, of these approaches is that they are sort of cross geography, cross commodity, really providing um, companies that source broadly um, through huge supply chains to use a common set of goals, common set of um, tools and metrics to look across their entire portfolio. So I think that's sort of a big, a big piece of what this entire tool set together has to offer. Um, I think also it provides um, an opportunity for um, communication of this information via sort of the these um, broadly available monitoring tools and then the metrics that they allow communication from traders up to their their buyers and really sort of provides this sort of many to many um, sort of communication across supply chains that's really essential for the transparency and traceability that all these actors are going to need to make effective decisions based on all of this information. Um, so, you know, our guidance, uh, certainly for, for traders who are using any of these tools or trying to use more of these tools um, to um, sort of really help to identify, minimize deforestation risk um, would be to use tools such as um, Trace and Pro to identify high risk areas, communicate clearly what's going on in those areas, and then use these tools and the information that comes out of them to clearly sort of show the progress that they're making towards decreasing and minimizing that, the, that risk in those areas, and then commuting that, communicating that effectively to their stakeholders. That's really sort of the, the information flow that we're, we're trying to uh, focus on with sort of that, that middle of the supply chain. Um, sure, and, and for, for financial institutions, I mean, I, I, it does seem that um, ever more institutions are, are looking at the you know, new ways in which to value their investments. So I guess these tools, again, very useful for, uh, for financial institutions concerned about the sort of deforestation risk we've been discussing. Absolutely, and financial institutions are um, sort of a huge piece of the, the puzzle and a huge set of stakeholders that we're, we're talking to right now that many of the coalition members are talking to right now. And you know, the things that, that what, what financial institutions right now really want is in, you know, clarity on how to understand all of the huge amount of information that is out there around deforestation risk, um, around climate risk, 
um, around uh, company performance to sort of simplify and clarify how they should be assessing their portfolio, how they should be making decisions. So, um, you know, the, the hope is that via sort of the standardization process um, that the accountability framework allows and the information sort of collection and dissemination that a lot of these tools allow for, um, we can really provide clarity to these financial institutions about what policies they should have in place and what information they should be using to screen their portfolio um, to really sort of minimize deforestation risk in their portfolio. And we're doing this in a number of ways. And one is through supporting um, many of our coalition members in developing guidance for financial institutions that's based in the accountability framework. A lot of our um, coalition members like WWF, like Global Canopy, like Ceres, um, work closely uh, with these financial institutions to help them develop their policies, develop their asks. And then um, on the data side, we're working closely with, um, with Global Canopy, with CDP, with other sort of data providers to ensure that the data that investors are getting um, is useful to them in helping to actually operationalize those policies. Hey, thanks very much, Abby. Question on certification is a good question. So our questioner asked about how existing commodity certification uh, fits into these supply chain tools that we've heard about today. So I wondered if um, Helen and Anders, very quickly, you could just respond to that. So how does what you're doing relate to supply chain, uh, to existing certification uh, for commodities? Helen. Right. Um, so where that data is available, we integrate uh, data on certification into our trace mapping um, of supply chains. Um, it depends on the type of certification. A lot of it is not necessarily physical segregated traceability. Um, so again, we can integrate that data and it's an important, important source of data and disclosure. Um, but in some cases, depending on the type of certification, it's still, it's still useful to understand where risks may lie. Um, and we also include information on certified um, mills in Indonesia, so both RSPO, but also ISPO as well. Um, so I think certification is definitely part of the puzzle. It's an important tool, um, but it's not the the only tool that's needed. Ian, can I can I build on that? Uh, sure. Let me in a sec, Pedro. Let me. I'd like to hear Anne's thoughts, and then if Pedro, I'll come oh, to okay. you. Your kind of your your thoughts, and kind of uh, from a corporate perspective. Anne. Thanks, Ian. Um, so, like Helen said, I think one element is definitely um, as 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 data partners and and input uh, to help contextualize some of the the data sets that we have in 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 GFW. Um, so, for example, um, in the palm sector, uh, we host RSPO con member concession data. Uh, we have the universal mill list, which includes certification status and is in line with the RSPO palm trace system and has cross-referenceable IDs with that system. So it's easy for, for users to understand what the, the link to that certification system is when they're uh, uh, looking in on what's happening in a specific production area uh, or, or, or processing facility. Um, but then I think there's also a use for uh, directly supporting the certification systems themselves and members of the cer certification systems in, in, in monitoring, say, certified areas in near real time for things like fires uh, and deforestation. This is something that we've also worked uh, directly with the RSPO on and supporting their fire monitoring systems. Um, but it can also be useful for a company to take a quick snapshot to look at um, at, a, at a kind of high level glance of if an area that they uh, are potentially looking at um, sourcing from or or um, uh, developing would be uh, at risk for uh, complying or not complying with the RSPO's 2005 cutoff date. The same thing would go for other certification systems that have cutoff dates. You could take a look um, uh, at the historical land use change. Uh, in an area to see what has happened uh, since the cutoff date. So that could, you know, goes for corporate commitment, individual commitment, but also individual certification system commitments as well. Great, thanks, Anne. Pedro, do you want to join it, jump in and just give some perspective from, you know, from a corporate perspective as to how these things can work together? Yeah, absolutely. I echo what Ellen, Ellen said before. Uh, I, I, I think that certification plays a role, an important role in, in being one of the means via which companies can implement the sourcing commitments, but on, not the only one. Uh, and, and there is no panacea. There is no silver bullet or something that will help us sort these out, uh, you know, in a, in a quick way. 
So certification plays a role from, from soy perspective. Uh, I mean, we buy Proterra certified soy. We support farmers get certified against the ITRS criteria. Uh, but again, these being part of the means via which we implement our commitment. Now, uh, uh, something that I would call out is that the more we can link uh, with the reality on the ground, the better, because again, thinking about certification, for beef, it's simply not available, and it's not going to be available in the in the in the near future, not as far as I can tell. Uh, but there are other means via which we can implement um, uh, these commitments around beef sourcing. So, I mean, thinking again from the perspective of AFI being helping with the what, helping set the ambitions, and then tools such as uh, Jeff W Pro and Trace helping with the how we get to implement these uh, commitments. Uh, the, the, the next piece that I would call out is linking that with the local reality about what can be realistically done. Uh, otherwise, uh, we are going to be coming up with solutions that are not going to be uh, pragmatic or not going to be feasible. Thank you. That's a, that's a very important point, isn't it? I mean, there's no point in having solutions that aren't going to be workable on the ground. I mean, the ambition can be there, but you need something to actually be able to make a difference on the ground. Um, I'd like to bring in a, another question. I think it's a really interesting one. Again, um, we've been talking a lot about, in a South American context, thinking really about a lot about Brazil. But our question makes the pretty valid point. How do you ensure that you don't just focus on one place and, and, and are thinking in terms of all the potential places where you're sourcing from and the potential areas, areas of risk? And I'd like to ask the panel, you know, how they, their tools you know, ensure that, you, that uh, from a buyer perspective, you know that you are covering off these potential areas of, of risk. Helen, do you want to have a go at that one? Yes, so um, for Trace, we cover, um, to address this issue, we try and cover as much globally as possible in terms of important sourcing countries where the data is available. So in, in South America, we cover Paraguay beef, uh, as well as Brazilian beef, and then soy across Argentina, Brazil and Paraguay in moving to Bolivia. There are challenges. So the data availability in Brazil is, is much better um, than in Paraguay in Argentina, where it's much more challenging to work. So I think it's also understanding how risks um, are different in different places, as well as the strength and availability of tools to support that. And there's also challenges around the availability of even things which sound obvious, like pasture maps, maize maps, soy maps in these different countries that make even, you know, even assessing commodity deforestation very challenging as well. So yes, it's really important to cover as many countries as possible, but also there's a reality that data quality will vary across these and that needs to be taken into account as well. Thanks, and do you have anything to add? No, that's, I think, a similar approach that GFW takes uh, when we're, we're trying to create scalable solutions that have coverage across different commodities and across different geographies, but then we still do at times need to prioritize on where we're going to dive deeper in. And that often sometimes means if the data is not available, uh, either commissioning that data, partnering with that data, or doing a, a deep dive on an effort. But of course, then this uh, still leaves us with uh, work to be done in different sectors. And I think we're at different kind of levels of, of data availability, both in terms of the, the supply chain intelligence and production area maps, as well as some of the more contextual uh, information maps that Helen mentioned, uh, depending on the different of areas and, and sectors that we're working in. Thanks. And, and Quedo, do you have any thoughts about um, ensuring that you do know the risks that are in the areas you're operating? I mean, there sometimes must be a risk, of course, that um, you know about the areas where there is data availability. There might be some areas where there is no data availability. What approach do you take then? I mean, I think it's a challenge that we all face, right? We, we try to get the best data available um, for the countries that are in the scope of, of our commitment. So. Um, I mean, as, as Ellen said, for Brazil, there's a lot of data, be it from the National Research Space Institute or be it from MEPBiomas or be it from other sources. Um, in other cases, we don't. And, and so we have to use the best data available. So, uh, I mean, and, and in Mexico and Argentina, for instance, which are under the scope of our uh, commitments for Latin America, we, we have been engaging with um, um, agencies in, in each country to, to try to find out what, what they have and how we could have access to that to use uh, in our uh, process to map the risks in our supply chains. That's right. Quick question uh, for you, Pedro, as well. Um, what's um, your strategy when it comes to thinking about um, 
uh, landscape approaches uh, and do you how much of the relevance of the tools we talk about today to be able to engage on a landscape level sorry is that is that for me to start with or it's better yeah to straight oh, okay, the questions yeah, are, you've been asked mars's view in this particularly yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for the question. It's it's an integral part of our approach. I mean, we are definitely looking to into in, uh, supporting landscape level initiatives, not only um, you know from Mars perspective, but also as uh, a perspective of the of the work that we're doing alongside with uh, twenty other major downstream companies in the in the Consumer Goods Forum, Forest Positive Coalition of Action. So so it's it, we are exploring a multitude of of, of initiatives. Uh, addressing different commodities, and, and we are going to be supporting those initiatives collectively. So linking with all the discussion that we're having today, having common approaches to implement these commitments, having common metrics to report on progress, having common uh, criteria for defining what at risk means is going to help us target common regions for, uh, for collective action. So I, I, I definitely see these as something that uh, we are exploring today and we're going to keep on exploring uh, in the future. And, and let me, just before passing over to Ellen and, and Annie, and uh, acknowledge the, the work that, I mean, the collective work, not only amongst downstream companies, but the collective work with civil society organizations, I mean, including uh, yourselves, and, uh, but also ProForest, who has been supporting us uh, along the way, and, and, and Ima Flora and NWF and others who have been part of this, of this journey with us. Okay, thanks, Pedro. Um, Helen and Anne, you wanted to come in uh, very briefly. Helen. Yeah, super quickly. I was just going to connect it to the discussion we had on indirect supply. A, a large majority of these supply chains are sourced indirectly, you know, 50% in the case of cocoa. We've talked about it in beef. And I think that's where landscape approaches are also incredibly important as one of the tools um, to address these, these challenges here. Great, thanks, Helen. Anne? Um, just to add, and I think Petra, you've touched on on some of this as well in some of your earlier comments, is, is an area that uh, we're quite interested in um, from Global Forest Watch's side is not just kind of ending it at the tool itself, uh, but looking at, because one of our objectives is to uh, align folks around a common tool and making that available, how can we then bring companies together in a pre-competitive space to collaborate on the protocols for how they would then use that analysis to then follow up. So one area that we're doing that with is, is 10 um, of the largest palm producers and buyers in what we call the RAD consortium who have, are looking at collective uh, strategies for how they can develop protocols on verifying and following up on alerts in specific landscapes, for example. So I think it's really key to translate from the tools to the reality on the ground, which is what you were mentioning, Petra, as well. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, question I want to put to, to Leah, um, and it's a question asking about, um, are the tools we've been discussing going to be aligned with the upcoming greenhouse gas protocol land sector guidance, or the science-based targets initiative, uh, FLAG initiative, another initiative, another acronym, uh, Leah? <laughs> Yeah, that's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, and the short answer uh, is, is yes, we're actually working really closely with both the uh, GHG protocols technical working group for their new um, land sector guidance, as well as with the um, science-based targets initiative, food, land and agriculture uh, team, which is what the flag stands for, um, to basically take all of this work we're doing on alignment around measuring, monitoring and reporting on deforestation and conversion and trying to ensure that that aligns with the ways that companies are being asked to take that information and convert it into emissions for their um, for their emissions reporting. So we're working closely at a technical level with both of those teams. We're hoping to also provide some sort of um, guidance and uh, communications from the AFI side on how those can be aligned better or how, the, how companies can use them in alignment. But um, this is really a priority for us because we wanna make it really clear uh, for our users that all of the work that they're putting into measuring their deforestation footprint, their conversion footprint and their land use change is going to be really essential when they're then asked to report on the emissions from that land use change. So this is a, a key piece of the work that we're doing and we're, we're um, yeah, happy to talk about that further. Great. Well, um, I'm very conscious we're coming towards the end of our time. Uh, the panel have been very diligently answering loads of questions on the, the Q&A. So thanks very much indeed to the panel for, for doing so. Um, as I said uh, earlier, um, our panelists will be available for, for follow-up. So if you have any more questions about using the tool set, then, then Leah, Helen, and Anne can all be reached for more information. I think we have a slide with their, yes, there we are. Um, we 
we'll make sure that those are shared with everybody as well. So you'll have access to the contact details to, to ask uh, further follow-up questions. But it's been great, the number of questions that have been coming in, really interesting points. So thank you very much indeed for all of them. So uh, my thanks to the panel for their insight today and to all of you who joined the call. I, I was looking, it was um, uh, 250 odd at one point. So thanks very much. It's been great to have so many people with us. Please do join the AFI team for more training webinars in the coming months. The, the next webinar in November will showcase the framework's uh, new operational guidance and worker rights. Um, to make sure you get all the details, do subscribe to the AFI newsletter, or you can check the events page for regular updates and to register. Um, and of course, the recording of this uh, webinar will be on that page as well eventually. But for now, though, uh, many thanks. Uh, I've been in Welsh, and goodbye. <laughs>